Matthew chapter 1, turn there. Matthew chapter 1. I prayed about a message to preach this morning, seeing that we're approaching the day we celebrate Christ's birth. I know Christ wasn't born on December 25th. We don't know what day he was born on. God didn't tell us. I think he didn't tell us for a reason, because some people would turn that into a religion. There is no commandment in the Bible to celebrate Christ's birth, but we have two of the four Gospels telling us how he was born, where he was born, how it fulfilled Scripture, some of the things that happened around his birth. So the Bible, with two witnesses, seems to tell us that that's significant. And something that I like to study is the symbols of the Bible, typology, the foreshadowing of the Bible. And I always think that Christ's first coming and how it happened is a picture of Christ's second coming. Because he's coming again. Somebody say amen. amen. He's going to come and take care of this horrible situation we're in in this country. He's going to come and take care of the horrible situation that everybody else is in their countries. He's going to come and he's going to bring down the rich people who are hoarding everything and won't give anything to save somebody's life. He's going to come down and take care of that. He's going to come down and create a perfect world or as near perfect as it can be in this life. He's going to come down and do that. Did you know the Bible says that all the hills are going to be smashed down flat and all the valleys are going to be lifted up? Did you know that not even lions will eat lambs anymore? They'll eat grass. The lion will be a pleasant beast to be around instead of an old grump wanting to kill. All the wars are going to end for a thousand years and nobody is going to have to give up their sons and daughters to fight a war. Nobody is. The world's economy is going to be better. The world itself is going to be more fruitful. Man is finally going to get to rest a thousand years from his labor here in this world. Somebody say amen. And ladies, I don't think having children is going to bother you near as bad. That ought to be something to get happy about, amen? So some of you ladies, hold out till Jesus comes, all right? <laughs> but I believe he's coming back. If I didn't believe that, Paul said if we didn't believe in the resurrection, we'd be of all men most miserable. Because we of all people know what's wrong with this world. And we know the only fix for it is Jesus Christ. Milton and Alfie, it's good to see you guys. I missed you. We love you. Yeah, amen. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, or that means in this way. It happened this way. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, by the way, the NIV, where the King James calls Jesus' parents, Joseph and his mother, the NIV says his father and his mother. That ain't right. Joseph was not his father. God was his father. Amen? She was the virgin who gave birth to the Son of God. Now, she was not the mother of God. God didn't have a mother. Amen? Uh, when, when she was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. It means the espousal that they had was a binding issue. And he would have to write a bill of divorce because of it. He could have made her a public example because she was pregnant before wedlock. But he chose not to. But he was concerned about it. He didn't understand it. And so, in verse 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And what that means, it's related to the names like in the Old Testament, like Joshua, Hosea, Isaiah, and several others. 
And what it means is, it's the Hebrew word for Savior. It means He will save us. And it's what it says. Thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. If God's done that for you, say Amen. Now all this was done, yeah, Amen. Clap if you want to. Get up and shout, I don't care. Now all this was done, Keep calm down John, you're around electronic equipment now. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin, not a young woman like the revised standard version says, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now I've made a point to study this out and to say this. You will never find, after this point, you will never find in the scriptures where anybody called him Emmanuel. Nobody called him that. But wasn't that supposed to be his name? Emmanuel, God with us. So what does that mean? Did somebody make a mistake? Did God miss the prophecy? No. He's coming back and when he does, he will be God with us. Somebody say, in fact, you could say this is Emmanuel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, and it's with us. Everywhere we go, amen? Then, verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now remember what that means. That means Savior. He's going to save us from our sins. Turn to John chapter 16. When you get there, we'll have prayer. And I want you to pray for me. I'm not kidding you. I'm already nervous about tonight. I'm going down to some people that I don't know and preach something that they may not want me to preach. There may be somebody there like I've met before who don't like what I'm going to say about the Bible. And I've been in several situations where those people have been very vocal about it. Almost to the point, I would say, almost to the point of blasphemy. And I just have to try to keep a civil tongue, not lose my temper, because to me it's a very frustrating issue trying to get people to believe what God said. It's very frustrating. When you believe what God said so much and you know that that will fix every problem that anybody can face in life, there's an answer in God's word for it. But getting people to believe it is difficult. And as I've said before, I don't like seeing people in bondage. So I'm already nervous about going down there tonight. I don't know quite how to preach this, but this is what God laid on my heart. So I want you to pray for me as we pray. If you're at John chapter 16, verse 21, say amen. amen. Father, we ask your blessings, and I'll need your help today. Father, I have nothing to say to these people and nothing to give them. And yet, they're on a long journey through life. They've already found out that that journey is very difficult. And in some cases, Father, it would seem impossible some of the things that some of the people in this church have been through God I don't know that I would make it I don't think I would so father I have to understand that you had to have helped them and that you'll help me if I ever face what some of these people are facing so father I'm thankful God for what you've done in these people's lives Thankful, God, for what you've done in mine. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless them this morning, that you would rise and give us bread to eat. We are on a long journey through life. And we have nothing to take with us. I have nothing to give them. So would you be a good neighbor to these people? And would you care about them? Would you love them enough to say what needs to be said to them? Father, if, if this message is anything, it's a message of hope. There is something better coming. And I struggle from day to day 
with the things that are going on in this world, fears that I have, anxiety, depression. And Father, if I didn't have a hope that the next life that I live is going to be far better than this one. If I didn't have that hope, God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't still be here today. Father, give us that hope. Give these people the same hope, God, that you've given me. That this life, we probably shouldn't expect a whole lot. But the next life is going to be better. Your first coming to this world was fantastic. And as I read the scriptures about your second coming, I'm amazed. At how much better this world is going to be. Lord, would you come quickly to this world? Would you do that? I'm as like everybody else, Father. I'm vexed by what I see in this world and what's going on. I don't like it. I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. So, Father, would you come quickly and be a blessing to this world, be a blessing to your people this morning. Preach to us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Turn to, you're there in John chapter 16. I have verse 21 up on, on, on screen, but I want you to, let's go back a little bit and look at verse 19 to get the context, to get the gist of what he's saying. There's a reason for this. As I was thinking about Matthew chapter 1, and the first coming and the second coming and so on, it has dawned on me more than once how many times in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, we're going to look at the Old Testament types and foreshadows this morning a little bit, and look and see how many, how many women in the Bible had more than one son. And in many cases, two of them, they were twins. Why was that? Why did Eve, why, we know that Eve gave birth to many sons and daughters. Genesis chapter 5 tells us that. But the story we know most is about the first two that she had. And I want you to think about those first two sons that Eve had, Cain and Abel. Out of those two, who was born first? And out of those two, who did God favor the most? Was it the firstborn? Or was it the secondborn? Now, Matthew, I didn't ask you to tell everybody the answer. There's always got to be the smart kid in every class sitting in the front row. Now, he's right. Why did God favor the second one over the first one? Why did God do that? Now, I want you to think about that. John chapter 16, verse 19. Now, Jesus knew uh, that they were desirous to ask him. And said unto them, Do you inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me? Because they were asking, Why is he going to leave? I mean, this is the best thing we've ever had, Jesus Christ. Why is he leaving? Why is he going away from us? This was the Son of God. This, he's going to bring in the kingdom of God. Why is he leaving? Jesus had a reason for it. He said, If I stay here, I can't give you the Holy Ghost. I'm going to give you, when I leave here, I'm going to give you something better than even me. And it was the Holy Ghost poured out so that everybody could know about him. Amen. Amen. Now you, you think about that. What God did, something in your life that may have upset you, it may have bothered you, it may have grieved you, it may have hurt you. But I guarantee you what God did then was so he could do this now. Does that make sense? How many times were you born? Which one would you say is a far better life? The first one or the second one? Second one. Okay? The first one, all you do is cry. Hold her up high. That's all you do, the first one. Amen? She's just being one of us. The second one, are you ever going to cry? God's going to wipe every tear from your eyes. So he said, verse uh, 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Now, he did not say maybe. 
He did not say if you were good enough. He did not say if you kept all the laws. He said your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, verse 21, this is what I have on the screen. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But, and I guarantee you, and I told, I told Michael this and I told some other people this last year. And I said, I don't know what's going on, but our church is in travail over something. And I said, that tells me that God is about to do something really good in our midst. There it is. 50,000 plus people we've counted so far. And we're still doing it. Okay? So he said, A woman when she is in travail has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man, and I want you to notice this, that a man is born into the world. Mary's hour came and she travailed in birth. Christ is coming again. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to get a glimpse, a picture of Christ, I believe, at his second coming. Revelation 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. 12 is God's number for promise. In Genesis 12 is when God made his promise to Abram, out of thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And he was referring to Jesus Christ. So look at verse 2. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. You might be in a situation right now in your life where travail is taking place of some kind. There may be sorrow in your life. There may be pain in your life. There may be anguish and fear and anxiety in your life. But all of that, when it's in God's hands, has a very good reason. Just as a woman who is travailing, that way she knows that she's about ready to deliver that child. And bless God, the hands of the abortion is, did not get a hold of it. Amen? Pain to be delivered. But I want you to notice, I don't have this on the screen, but I want you to notice in verse 3, there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And I want you to notice this. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. I guarantee you the devil's standing in front of you right now to stop your blessing from ever coming. Somebody say amen to that. He'll steal it. He'll devour it. He'll destroy it. In fact, he's devouring what I believe is the Son of God. If you look in... Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 4, you have the parable of the seed and the sower, the Bible says that the devil, Satan, devoured the word of God as soon as it was sown in somebody's life. And I've seen that. I've seen somebody being given the word of God, then break down and weep over it, and immediately the devil came and snatched it right out of their heart, and they never got saved. I've seen it. He'll fight you tooth and nail, He will fight you to keep you from receiving the blessing that God wants to give you. So verse 5. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to His throne. And Psalm 91 talks about the secret place of the Most High. And they that dwell in it. And God will protect them. And no harm will ever come to them. And that is God's promise to you. Somebody say Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. You turn it. Boy, if I, don't, if I don't cool my voice down a little bit, I won't have nothing to preach with tonight. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, this is what Jesus said before he came and appeared in the womb of Mary. Jesus was alive before that. And he said these words, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Now you are in the body of what God prepared in your mother's womb for this life. But guess what? That one's going to fail. Make it quick, Lord. The next one he's preparing 
right now. It's in you. And it won't fail. Amen? In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And he says in verse 9, he says it again. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Now I want you to notice this phrase. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Now what did we find out from John what the disciples were upset about? Jesus said, I'm leaving. And they got angry. They got worried. They said, why are we following you if you're just going to leave us? They didn't understand that he had to do away with the first so he could bring about the second. And the second is always better than the first in God's kingdom. Amen? Now, Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Cain and Abel. What does your Bible say? Why did he, why does the Bible tell us this story? Why is it there? Paul said these things that are written are written for our examples and for our learning unto whom the ends of the world are come. And I guarantee you, you've probably in your life at least once and probably more than once faced a situation where you thought it was the end of the world. I've been there. I've been there. Praying that God would deliver me. Praying that God would just come and, and, and just do away with all this sinful, wicked world. And just take me on home. Ready to give up. Ready to quit. So God tells us this story for a reason. Adam knew his wife. Eve his wife. And I want you to notice that even though Adam and Eve had joined together as husband and wife, while they were in the Garden of Eden, before sin entered into the world... She did not conceive a child until after sin entered into the world. And her firstborn son, she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now look at what she said. She is not the first person in the world. Well, maybe she was. I'll say it differently. She's not the only person in the world who ever felt like Boy, this is God's greatest blessing only for it to go away and go bad. Think about this. Let's say that Sister Pam here had a bad liver. And she came and we prayed. Her liver's bad and it's going to kill her. And there's nobody to donate a new one. God, would you heal her? And God healed her. Gave her a new liver. Well, that'd be great, wouldn't it? She's still going to die. She's going to die with a brand new liver. Now, I want you to think about this. Eve rejoiced that she had gotten a man from the Lord. But this man turned out to be practically the devil himself. But was not able better than Cain. The Bible says in verse 2, And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And we know what happened there. Cain was angry against his brother that God accepted Abel's sacrifices, and God rejected Cain's. And so Cain slew Abel, murdered his own brother. What does the Bible say? 1 John three twelve. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. All of Cain's deeds were evil, the Bible says. One who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Think about your first birth. And everything about you is wicked. Everything about this body is wicked. It is full of lust. It is full of depravity. It is full of pride. It reeks of sin and rebellion against God. But when God gives us that second body, there will be no more sin, no more death, no more curse, no more dying, and no more tears. Somebody say amen. God testified, Hebrews 11, 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. The second was better than the first, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, 
God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. I took a man last week, I didn't tell him this story, but usually everybody that I take up into this little secret Area 52 compound here, in my rubber padded room, I tell the story of the man who built that room, my brother-in-law Steve. And if you didn't know him, tell God thank you. He was wicked. He was a thug. A drunk, foul mouth, lascivious, dope head. He came at me at least twice when I worked with him and was going to kill me. And he probably would have come close to doing it. He told me one time, I saw him come through the house at me. And I went, oh no. And he said, yeah, there's a reason why I didn't tear your head off. I saw your glasses and I didn't want to break your glasses. And I went, gulp. It wasn't me. It's was my glasses. Do you know what God did with him? Changed him. And he would sit there in that second pew right there, sitting next to his mother, with a King James Bible in his hand. And even in prison, when they tried to hand him an NIV, he said, I ain't reading that. I need the Bible. I want a King James. And God got his, got his heart straightened out, came to, he built that room, came to me a week before he passed, came into my office and said, Mike, I want to make sure I'm going to heaven. I said, Steve, I can tell you are. I prayed with him, read scripture to him. He sat in the service that week and he died that Friday. In heaven! He's there right now. The second was better than the first. And out of that room comes... 80% of this church's ministry out of that room. He, being dead, yet speaketh. His testimony of what God did in his life goes all over. They're hearing about this right now in Turkana, Kenya. So tell me about the relative that you got that's no good. That's a drunk. That's a dope head. That'll steal from his own family. That'll shoot somebody and try to kill him. Tell me about that person. And I'll tell you somebody that's waiting on a second chance for God to do something good in their life. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'm preaching this a lot better than your amen. And I know that. Now turn to Galatians chapter 4. In fact, now from this point, I want you to think of two brothers in the Bible. Two brothers that display exactly what I'm referring to. You can't say Ishmael and Isaac because that's what I got on the screen. That's a free one. Two brothers. Huh? Jacob and Esau. Got them in my notes. Two more. I guess it's time to learn. Galatians chapter 4 tells us this allegory of Ishmael. Who was born first? Ishmael was. But he was not born of promise. He was born of a woman who was in bondage. Meaning he had to be in bondage. Isaac was born second. And that's the lineage that our Savior came from. Not Ishmael. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. By the way, look at your Bible here. Two covenants. This is the old covenant. This is the new. Which one's better? The new one. Which one saves you? The new one. Which one doesn't require strict, perfect obedience to law? Which one says, if you'll just trust God, He'll save you? The new one. The new one's better than the first one. Somebody say amen. And they said that's what they are. They're the two covenants. Um, the one from Mount Sinai... The Ten Commandments, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. 
But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate, got somebody in this church's favorite passage of the Bible. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. And I guarantee you, you've got family members and friends that hate your guts. They despise you. They despise your beliefs. They despise your religion. They mock you. They make fun of you. They want nothing to do with it. Why? Because they know down deep inside that your life is actually better than theirs. That when you lay your head down at night, you don't have to worry where you're going to spend eternity because God has shown you you're going to heaven. Amen. But as, uh, verse 29, but, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Forget about the old life. Forget about what you used to do. Forget even about the sins of yesterday. And I mean literally 24 hours ago. Cast them out. Because what good are they? They're not helping you any. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Do you see what he did? He took away the first and established the second, didn't he? Who's next? Who did you say, Alicia? Jacob and Esau. Anybody got anybody else? They're the next in line. Genesis 25, turn there. Who was born first? Who? Who? I heard somebody say Jacob, I think. Genesis 25, Esau was born first. So who got the everlasting inheritance, Esau or Jacob? God took away the first that he may establish the second. As, as was with Ishmael and Isaac, Christ was not born of the lineage of Ishmael. He was born of the lineage of Isaac. In this case, was Christ born of Esau, the Edomites, or Jacob, who was Israel? Jacob, the second son, not the first. Genesis 25, verse 22. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so... Why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. And notice this. Two manner of people. Two completely different people. Um, shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other. And the elder shall serve the younger. Do you know what that means in your life? That now that you have Christ living in you, the flesh must yield to the Spirit. That's good stuff. Amen? You didn't know all this was in your Bible. You thought it was just Sunday school stories. Romans 9.13 said, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now tell me what Esau looked like. What did he look like? A beast! Thank you, sister. He was a wild beast. He is a picture of your flesh which cannot cease from sin. It's like telling that we got a stupid dog in our house that's always got his nose up the other two dogs' rear ends. And no manner of kicking him and scolding him will stop him from doing it. Hate that stupid dog. That's Esau. That's my flesh. My flesh is irreparably wicked and depraved and cannot serve God. But my flesh must yield and give way to my spirit, who is Jesus Christ. Amen! That's good stuff, isn't it? Who's next? We're going right down the line. We had 
Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, Esau and Jacob. Who's next? Huh? Nope. Perez and Zerah. Now you might have had to study a little bit more for these two. Turn in Genesis 38. I'm going to make you read it. Genesis 38. Does anybody know who was born first? Zerah or Perez? Who was born first? Well, let me say it like this. Who was supposed to be born first? I can tell y'all need to go home and read your Bible. Genesis 38, verse 27. It came to... Now, ask, hey, hang on a second. How did these two boys end up being conceived? Does anybody know the story? Let me tell you something. Jesus' family was just as messed up and vulgar and nasty as your family is. Judah had two sons that died. And they were promised to Tamar. Tamar was the wife of one. He died. His younger brother took his place, but he spilled his seed and God killed him. And she's wanting another child from Judah to be married to. And Judah's not having it. He didn't, he's not going to do it. And so she tricked Judah by playing a harlot, laying with Judah. Judah was going to have her killed until she said, well, guess whose uh, stuff this is who left it in my house that night? It was Judah's. And Judah said, you're more righteous than I am. The harlot gave birth to a son who Jesus came from. Jesus, hey, Jesus died even for his own family's sins. Amen? Don't give up on your family. It came to pass in the time of her travail that behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that one put out his hand and the midwife took and bound his hand upon his hand a scarlet thread. Have you ever seen that scarlet thread somewhere else in your Bible? Rahab the harlot. There is a scarlet thread woven all through your Bible that ends up in the red letter pages of your King James Bible. That scarlet thread is Christ. He's woven into the passages of everything in your Bible. The first child, he breached the womb. They saw him as technically the firstborn. So they tied a red ribbon around his hand, but his hand went back in and said, this came out first. Verse 29, it came to pass as he drew back his hand that behold, his brother came out and she said, how hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Do you know what the word Perez means? It's real easy. It means breach. You know what Perez did? Breached the womb. He breached the law of who was to be the first. The firstborn child was the one to receive the inheritance, right? But the firstborn child, which was us being born into this world, is not capable of receiving the inheritance because the inheritance that we want comes from God, who must be our father. Amen? So, afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name is called Zerah. Now, does anybody know what the word Zerah means? This is in, I like studying words. In the International Space Station, the Russians built part of the modules that are up there right now. And they named one of the modules they built Zarya, which is related to Zara, because you know what they both mean? Rising. The first may have breached the covenant. The second one will rise again. Matthew chapter 1, Judas begat Perez of Zerah of Tamar, and Perez begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram. Christ's lineage, the first time he came, came from the second child, not the first. And by the way, 
Pharez means breach. Zerah means rising. Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. And the number of days in which ye search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. God had offered Israel a covenant, and he said, I'm going to give you this land. But they refused to go in, not believing God. And so it wasn't God that breached or broke the covenant. It was Israel that broke the covenant. Therefore, that watch this. What generation of Israelites got to go into the promised land? The people that left Egypt or the people that were born in the wilderness? Second generation gets to go in. The first perishes goat walking in circles. Somebody in that cool. Yeah, listen, you'd just be happier if you read your Bible every now and then. Isaiah 58, 12. And they that shall be of these shall build the old waste places. And thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called, watch this, the repairer of the breach. The restorer of paths to dwell in. Did not our forefathers know the old paths? And did they not walk in them in this country? I'm ready for somebody to rise up to restore these old paths. Somebody say amen. And by the way, that's Christ at his second coming, not his first. Malachi chapter 4, 2, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness arise. That word is Zerah. With healing in his wings. Somebody say amen. So who's next? She, you know, she's back there going, this one. This one. And I'm going, are you nuts or something? Isn't that how Elena claps her hands? Yeah. Are you sure? Manasseh and Ephraim. Turn to Genesis 48. Who was born first? Manasseh. But Manasseh didn't get the blessing that he should have. Genesis 48, 13. Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left. So he brings, here's Joseph now, and, and um, Jacob is in Egypt with his brethren, with his sons. And so Joseph wants his sons to receive. And by the way, Joseph wasn't the firstborn of Jacob. He was next to last. He was the 11th son. Benjamin was the last. Who was the first one? Does anybody know? Simeon. And you know what Simeon, was it Reuben or Simeon? Reuben. We'll say it's Reuben for now. We'll let Pam be right. Reuben lay with his father's concubine and lost that blessing. Because let me tell you, sin will do it to you every time. Let me hear an amen on that. Sin will do it to you every time. So Joseph brings his two sons. And he's got Manasseh at his left hand to put at his father's right hand. And he's got Ephraim at his right hand to put at his father's left hand. And he intends for his father to reach out and bless and give them the firstborn son blessing. By touching Manasseh's head with his right hand. By the way, 27 bones in your hand. 27 books in the New Testament. You see what that means now? It's Christ and salvation. But J uh, Jacob doesn't do that. Look at verse 14. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. That means he knew what he was doing. Can I tell you something that I intend to help you with? Your father always knows what he's doing. Even when you're wounded by it. I can't stand here and tell you that everything that God has done in my life, I've enjoyed. But I can tell you that everything that God has done in my life, I know was for my benefit. Even if I couldn't see it. You see, Joseph 
Joseph stepped in. He blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. You see, Joseph said, Dad, you're not doing it right. And Jacob said, I know what I'm doing. Now, I've said that to God before. God, you know, this is not right. I don't like this, God. I don't want to go through this, God. It would be better if I was never born, God. God, why did you call me? God, why did you even bother with me? And God would say, Mike, I know what I'm doing. Will you trust me? And I can't tell you how many times I've struggled with trusting God. But I know my father always knows what he's doing. Always. Let me ask you this question. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't, I don't just always assume that everybody's saved who comes to church. I know that a year before my brother-in-law died, I prayed one prayer for him. That's the only one I remember. I may have prayed more for him after that, but I remember praying one prayer for my brother-in-law. Was that I would know that when he died, I would know that he's going to heaven. And God answered that prayer better than I prayed it. See, I'd witnessed to my brother-in-law before, several times, and that led up to him storming through the house, wanting to tear my head off. The second time I did it, I felt very strongly that I had to, and he was driving one of our company trucks, and he told me later, had he not been driving the truck, he would have tore my head off. My point is this, my brother-in-law at that time was not ready to give up his sin. He wasn't ready. God had to let him go about as low as a man could go. And I haven't told you the half of it. But he was one bad fellow. But I loved him. I cared about him. And I often tell God that I'm very proud of God for saving my brother-in-law because I cared about him. And I can tell you that his first life was bad. But his second life he is enjoying right now the promises that God made to him. That Jesus provided for him. And I'm going to ask you this question. Are you at a place in your life where you're tired of sin? And if you are, the camera is zoomed in on me. It's not seeing anybody in the congregation and nobody's looking around. If you would like for me to pray for you, that's all I'm going to do is pray. I'm not going to come get you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I don't believe in doing that. But maybe you're at a point in life where you realize the first life is not what you thought it was going to be. And you're tired of living in sin. And you know that you can't change. Only God can do that for you. And you're ready for the second one. If there's anybody here like that, would you raise your hand? I'll pray for you. I see them. I see them. Now those of you online, I, obviously I can't see your hand, but God does. And God knows your heart. Maybe... 
I don't know, maybe you didn't want to raise your hand. You didn't want me to see it. But I'm going to have prayer for you right now. And if God leads it in your heart, you can come to one of these benches. And this whole church will pray for you. If there's something else on your mind or your heart, may not have anything to do with what I preached on this morning. But you're weighted down and can't carry it any longer. I can tell you God's doing it for a reason. And you can trust him that he knows what's best. Maybe you'd like to come as well. So before we pray, if you'd like to just step out, come down here, pray with God's people this morning. I'm giving you that chance right now. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you, God, for the things we've seen. Your word is awesome. It is full of rich treasures, like what we've heard this morning. The end of it, Father, we'll never, we'll never reach the end of the blessings of the word of God in this lifetime. My prayer is this morning, God, that the preaching of your word would not go out and return void. But that it would accomplish what you sent it forth to do. And that, Father, you would be a blessing to somebody's life today who's tired of living the life of Cain, Esau, Manasseh. They know that you can't bless a life of sin. And so, Father, I pray that you would reach down from heaven to somebody's heart today and show them that, number one, you know what you're doing and that they can trust you. And, God, you know that there's been times that was the hardest thing for me to do was trust you. But Father, it was the best thing that I've ever done. And I'm glad I did. And that, Father, you would find somebody today who's tired of living the life of Cain. Always jealous. Always disobedient. And they know they can't go on this way. That life lived that way isn't worth it. But you have a better life for them. And it's everlasting. So Father, would you do that today with your word. Reach down into somebody's heart. And bless them. In spite of what they've done. Forgive their sins. That they could go to be with the rest of us. And those that have gone on before. Who are enjoying heaven right now. While we have to endure this world. Bless your people and bless your word we pray in Jesus name. And all of God's people said. Amen. Would you stand to your feet?